pray for them as well. Uh, now, for those of us who are new to our church, uh, we are in the midst of our efficient, uh, efficient uh, Bible, um, not Bible story, um, pulpit series, right? And one of the major themes of the epistle is the unity of the church. And that's why we have titled, or rather I've titled uh, today's sermon uh, and next week's sermon as United in Christ. Now, the first three chapters of uh, Ephesians, actually, the Apostle Paul teaches that Christ has broken down the dividing wall of hostility between the Gentiles and the Jews. And that through the cross, all those who call on the name of Jesus are reconciled back to God and are one family. So this means that God has chosen us. He has adopted us. He has redeemed us through Jesus Christ. And Paul reminds us that all of this is done by God's grace. It's not because of anything we have done or could do. God's purpose, and Paul is very clear, therefore is to bring unity to all things under Jesus Christ. Now, today we are embarking on the second half of Ephesians. Uh, chapter 4 to 6 is linked to the first half by the word, therefore. Paul shifts gear and talks about how the gospel then should affect how we live out our lives, whether in the community, at home, or even at the workplace. And as God's family, we are expected to maintain that same unity that He has given us. So Paul is actually very intentional in the way that he structured his letter. And in fact, many of his episodes, he does the same thing. He talks about theology first and then practical applications after that. He wanted the Ephesian church to be clear about what the Christian doctrine is before focusing on Christian behaviour. Knowing the truth should lead us to live out the truth. So for this week and next, we will be focusing on Ephesians chapter um, one, uh, chapter 4, verses 1 to 16, but today we will focus on uh, 1 to 6. Okay, and this whole chunk right, is a call for the church to be united in Christ while expressing itself to attain a new unity of faith. So that's uh, just a very quick five-minute summary of everything that if you have missed uh, and you are prepared to go into uh, this new segment, uh, the new second half of uh, Ephesians chapter 4. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the word given to us through the Apostle Paul. And even as we have studied the first half of Ephesians, we pray that you continue to open our minds to your truths. As we read your word today, Holy Spirit, would you help us to apply these truths to our lives? May we be found united in Christ, who has redeemed us and brought us into the family of God. May we be found faithful. Speak through me dear Lord, so that your people will hear and will obey you. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Can I just invite congregation, can we just rise to read the, the, these six verses? Alright, one, two, three. I, therefore, a prisoner for the Lord, urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love, eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. There is one body and one Spirit, just as you were called to the one hope that belongs to your call, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. Please be seated. And so, if we have not, even if you have not read the first three chapters, it is clear that when we read uh, this, the first verse of chapter 4, is that the church had a problem. They were not walking, they were not walking in a manner worthy of the calling to which they were called. While the words used may be simple, right? A couple of words need to be unpacked before we can actually go further. And the first jargon that I would like to clarify for us is this word, calling. So what is calling? I mean, in English, it can mean many things, right? We have lawyers who are called to the bar. We have, um, you know, someone is called so-and-so, you know, whether by profession or by uh, name. But in this context, this calling here is what Paul has been saying about God's magnificent plan in the first three chapters of the epistle. So again, let me just allow me to summarize very quickly. We are chosen and loved in Christ to be holy before the world was created. We were adopted as God's children. We will receive an inheritance. We are sealed with the Holy Spirit. 
we are seated next to God. We are the new temple where the Holy Spirit dwells in. We are united, Jews and Gentiles alike, because of Christ Jesus. Now, we have been invited into God's family, and I think that's the crux of this call. And by God's unmerited grace, we are forgiven, made holy, and adopted as His children. This means that we have done nothing to deserve God's grace and mercy. But it does mean that we have a weighty obligation to walk worthy of this calling. So then it leads me to explain the next part. What does it mean to walk worthy? Now, in Greek, uh, and some of you already know I, I didn't do very okay. Technically, I did well in Greek, but I don't know much about Greek because my lecture was lenient. But um, because of Bible software, etc., I'm still able to you know, grasp a bit. And this word, uh, worthy, in Greek, actually means, uh, in English, balancing the scales. Balancing the scales. So essentially, what Paul is trying to tell us when he says, work worthy of this calling, is saying, church, live up to the standard to which you have been called. You do not walk worthy so that God will love you. You walk worthy because He loves you. So we are called to balance the scale, the scale that God has uh, raised us up to because He has called us His children. And so many of us may be familiar with the story of Cinderella, right? This fairy tale. The young girl was made to do chores under the supervision of her evil stepmother, right? And the fairy tale did not show us what happened after she married the prince. Right? It stops with, and they live happily ever after. Okay, but I would imagine, all right, um, out of habit, sometimes she may start sweeping the floor. You know, she will sweep the floor, and then her hands dirty, she'll just like wipe on her dress. And can you imagine the governors, the nurses, and, and even the, the maidservants of the castle will be like, my dear princess, this is so unbecoming of you. This is not what a princess should be doing. You shouldn't be walking around with your dirty handprints on your dresses. Right? Like us, Oh, sorry, like Cinderella, many of us have been given this new status. We are the children of the living God and we are a royal priesthood. But at times, we fail to live up to that standard. We fail to show the world what it means to be a child of God. So let us bring, into our daily conduct, uh, bring our daily conduct into balance such that it corresponds to the calling to which we have been called. We are brought into God's family and are expected to maintain the unity of the body of Christ. And so if we put everything together, we know that we know all the theory that we've learned in chapter uh, 1 to 3. And in chapter 4 to 6, we are challenged to practically reflect this status that's given in Christ. And so we are forced to ask ourselves the question, are you worthy? Are you walking worthy of your calling? Now, if we were to evaluate ourselves as a church, are we walking worthy? How are we doing as children of God? Are we filled with the Holy Spirit? Are we doing the good things that He has called us to? How are we treating our fellow brothers and sisters in Christ? Are we experiencing real unity and peace with each other and with God? Now, I confess, it is not easy to do an objective evaluation because, you know, as Asians, we often are highly critical of ourselves. And even when I ask you these questions, you are immediately thinking of all the negative things that you have done, all right, or you, things that you should have done. But the truth is, we have done well in many areas. And I want to um, you know, just encourage us to continue uh, the good job that we are doing. I see members who are stepping up to use their God-given gifts to serve the church. And that is walking worthy of a calling. I've seen people providing pastoral care at other, for others at great personal sacrifice. That is walking worthy of your calling. We are active in, our, our, uh, active in reaching out our community through our neighbourhood visitation. We have many people who are volunteering at BCS for the sake of reaching or building that relational breach to our residents. Whether it's at legal clinic, counselling, tuition, uh, befriending our homeless friends at S3P. All this, when we do this, we are walking worthy of our calling. So yes, in many ways, we are walking worthy of the calling to which we are called. But yes, there are areas that we are also not doing so well. I'm not going to give any example here because uh, when I was telling Elaine, I was struggling. Because if I come up with any examples, some people might think I'm talking about them because I do know many people here. Right? So I leave it to your own personal reflection because I, I do want to stay alive. Right? <laughs> um, but the point is, <laughs> we do need to take a serious consideration 
of this question. What are the areas that we are not walking worthy uh, of our calling? There's this folklore, you know, uh, of Alexander the Great. You all know this great conqueror, right? Um, he was walking through the camp and he spotted this sleeping soldier. So he woke the soldier up and he demanded, What is your name, soldier? And this trembling soldier, of course, woke up and he recognised the general and trembling, he said, My, my name, sir, is, is Alexander. And so, folklore has it that Alexander told him, Either change your name or live up to your name. Either change your name or live up to your name. And that is the same thing that we are called to as Christians. If we call ourselves Christ followers, but we find that we are not following Christ, or we are not living up to the standard that is expected of a Christ follower, then we either have to change our religion, right? But that, that's, I don't think that's going to happen. Right? So that means we are left with only one choice. We better buck up and step up. And so if there are any areas in our lives that are not consistent, whether as individuals or as a body life, they are not consistent with our name and our position as God's children, we need to change our way of life to walk worthy of our calling. Our lives must add weight to the gospel. It must reveal the gospel to the people who do not know him and reveal Christ to the world. Now, well, as I asked uh, in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 1, is that are we walking worthy of this calling? And to answer this question, we must see if both our beliefs and our behavior match up. Okay, this is the next part that you, uh, some of you, the designers here, might be laughing at me, but this is my. Uh, I see Rick being very judgy already. <laughs> I'm trying to. Put <laughs> Those of you who know me that my art is very bad. Uh, in fact, my mom actually did my art for me when I was in secondary school. Uh, but this one, my, my mom didn't do it, okay? This is, this is me. This is purely me. I take full responsibility of how badly this will turn out. But, okay, I'm trying. I'm trying, okay? Um, I'm trying to use this graphic to explain what I'm expressing verbally, right? If our beliefs and our behaviour match up, that's where we are walking worthy, right? This is a simple Venn diagram, right? Beliefs, red or orange, and then blue is the behaviour. And so I believe that all born-again Christians, genuinely, we want to live up to the standard to which we have been called. But the truth is, there are discrepancies on this side of eternity, right? And they can end up on the overlap, outside of the overlap area, right? The XXX, right? Um, and so, according to Paul, what is important is right doctrine, will inform us of the right behaviour, correct? And so, this is where I try to explain, okay, so this is a bit complicated. Right beliefs should lead us to right behaviours, right? But it's also true that our behaviours will reveal our beliefs. I'll let that sink in for a while, right? Because we are left with this paradox, this inconsistency that we have is because our behaviours sometimes reveal that our belief system is not what we thought it is. It's not a chicken and egg scenario, right? And, and Paul later reveals in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 17 to 24, that our behaviour is a result of our minds being darkened and our hearts being hardened. So our beliefs shape our behaviours. But we need to check our behaviour to reveal our beliefs. Okay, I, I use a lot of words, I, I just repeat again, right? Our beliefs shape our behaviours. And we check our behaviour to reveal our beliefs. And so when there's discrepancy between our belief and our behaviour, it, it could be because we are unaware of this contradiction, right? We have blind sides, we have our um, blind sides that we, we do not know unless someone comes in and says, hey, you said this and this, but why are you doing this and this? And this is where we, we, can, we can start to to ponder and to think, right? And so if we are to walk worthy of the calling, we need to confront if we have mistaken beliefs or incongruent behaviours. Right? So let's look at the first problem. Is it a problem with behaviour? Now, this we'll be looking at verses 2 to 3, right? And this involves applying all our theology, everything that we've learned, right, in real churches with real people. Not as an ideal, but it is a reality. Right, it is, on one hand, we are, giving, we are given, um, it's not like we are on a, during COVID days, for example, right? 
in COVID days, we just switch on our TV, we listen to the, the, the we join in the worship service, we listen to the sermon. There's no life with other believers. That was probably the most peaceful time in our church because you don't have zero, almost zero interaction, right? But now that is, we are back to physical church, right? Whether in the houses or in church, we sometimes literally step on each other's toes, right? Just coming up the staircase, we might bump into each other and we get frustrated, right? And so we are called to practice all our theology, all our understanding into practical aspects in our daily lives, even when we are together, right? Especially when we are together. But Paul also noted that it is very easy for us to break this bond, this uniting bond, you know, through falsehood, through arrogance, through pride, through selfish assertiveness. Things that Paul addresses later on uh, in chapter, chapter 4, verse 17 to chapter 5, verse 14. And so our behaviours can actually, can and will break down this unity of the Spirit that God has given us. We walk unworthily of our calling in Christ if we disregard the unity of the body and fail to make every effort to safeguard what Christ has died to obtain. Now, how does this look practically? Right? And Paul here talks about four different virtues. There's humility, gentleness, patience, and forbearance. Right? Let's, talk, let's tackle the first one. Now, many of us actually see humility as a virtue today. Right? But this was not always the case. In the days of uh, Paul, right, the Greeks actually used a similar objective for the word humble. And it was always used uh, or associated with slaves or servants. Now, theologians have observed that this Greek word was not used before New Testament time. And it, in fact, it could actually be a coined by Paul or, or one of his peers. It is a compound of two Greek words. And when put together, these two words literally means humiliation of mind. Humiliation of mind. And that's what humility is supposed to mean in, to us as Christ believers. Now, it is because of Christ's example on the cross that this idea of humility became a virtue that Christians ought to strive for. Right? Many of us here have, have memorized Philippians uh, chapter 2, verse 3. Right? We are to strive for humility. It is the same word here found in uh, Ephesians chapter 2, verse 3 and Ephesians chapter 4, verse 2. And so Paul exhorts us to pursue humility by seeing the inherent worth and value of others, not of ourselves, but of others, just as how Christ saw the value of us. And I think that when we sit beside a church friend right, and listen to him talk, uh, or her talk, right, uh, and I mean really, really listen, we are practicing humility. Because why? Many of us are very quick to give solutions, right? to give solution to a problem that someone is talking about. And I propose that when we are so quick to give um, these solutions, it actually makes us feel good because we are, you know, we, we may not explicitly tell the person, but inwardly we feel good about ourselves because we managed to solve a problem that someone else couldn't. It means that, it could mean that we are more experienced, it could mean that we are better, um, we are able to do something that someone else can't. And so I think we need to be quick to resist this urge to give solutions because that may not be what the person wants anyway. When we truly listen, we are not busy formulating our responses. We are not thinking about, oh, I also had the same experience, right? But we are giving the person our full attention and that's what it means to, to give worth to that person. And in many ways, uh, for many of us, including myself, I, I need to grow in this kind of humility just to listen and to give full attention, to give everything that I have to this one person at that particular time. And another way that we can grow in humility is by valuing the opinions of others. And this is especially true in today's uh, post-truth age, right, where there is no one single truth and we are often quarrelling or debating, right, what is one truth. Now, if we actually take time to listen where the person is coming from um, you know, and remain open in our, um, in our conversation, in our dialogue, we may change our, our standpoint. When we do this, we are actually demonstrating humility and also maintaining our unity in Christ. Again, uh, let, me just, let me just caveat that everything I'm sharing is in the context of church. 
Right? Because this is what uh, Paul is telling us. We are to practice these four virtues within the church. Not that we don't practice it outside church, but the examples are given are specific to how we practice it in the church context. Right? Now, the second virtue that, that Paul talks about is gentleness. Again, similar to the word humili- uh, humility, it is a misunderstood word. We often think of someone who is gentle uh, as someone who is weak, who is compliant, who is mal-mannered. Right? The Greek word uh, was often used on domesticated animals, strangely enough. Uh, and when applied to people, it actually means that the person is restraining his strength or her strength in order to be courteous and considerate of others. In other words, gentleness is not that you have no strength. It's not that you are powerless. Gentleness in our Christian context means that great strength being withheld. Great strength being withheld. And you see that example in Jesus. Right? We can demonstrate this gentleness by speaking kindly to others and refraining from harsh criticism or even condemnation, whether verbally or in our minds. We can choose to turn the other cheek and respond gently instead of choosing violence as our first response. And this is something that I'm also trying to inculcate in my children. Uh, I, yeah, there's a whole new... <clears throat> you know, but as a father, because I also father them, it means that when I'm disciplining my children, I can choose to be firm. I withhold my strength. But yet, I be gentle with my words and my actions. And this is something that, again, I do need to grow. Uh, actually, I, I, I shouldn't need to confess. In all areas, I need to grow. Right? I, I shouldn't have so much uh, self-information. If not, you all keep thinking I'm a... Actually, no, I'm a broken person. I, I can just admit here. All right, anyway, moving on to the third virtue, patience. Now, this patience is not about waiting for delays without becoming anxious or annoyed. But this patience is toward a person. Right? It's toward a person. And in the context of chapter 4, verse 2, this patience refers to the ability to endure challenging situations without losing one's temper or being resentful. Now, it's, it's like a fuse of a dynamite, right? Uh, if we say that our dynamite is like our temper, then we have to have a long fuse. We are long-suffering, right? And so, uh, one way that we apply it in our church context is when we disciple others. Okay, uh, youth, rest assured, I'm not talking about you guys, Okay. When, when we disciple others, we may struggle to understand why some of them are not having a breakthrough. Right? We're like, ah, I've been journeying with you for two, three years. Why are you still harping on the same issue over and over again? When we are patient with them, we know that different people will need different time for them to come before God and repent and to have their own breakthrough. As disciple makers, we are called to be long-suffering and patient for God to do His work. And so, the last virtue that we will quickly talk about is uh, that Paul exhorts the church to bear with one another in love. Now, I've, I've termed this as forbearance. Right? In other words, we are to practice forbearance to one another. Now, when sinful people come together, there will definitely be tensions, there will definitely be conflicts. And we are told to forbear each other, tolerating the shortcomings and faults of others without being critical or judgmental. But Paul here, he takes it up a notch to say that we are to forbear with love. This means that we choose to overlook the faults and shortcomings of others and instead, we see who? We see Christ in them. In situations where we have personality differences, theological disagreements or even conflict, we must be willing to give grace to others just as Christ has given grace to us. And this is why I mentioned just now that I think everything in this worship service is bringing to this point, even when Cheryl was leading us to think about the one person that we are maybe frustrated over. This is what it means to show forbearance and to seek forgiveness. Now, as we grow to be an authentic community of faith, it means that we will embrace people from different walks of life, different cultures, different personalities, different races, uh, even different ages, right? Um, people with physical or even mental illnesses, people that are sexually broken. And you know, as we look at all these differences, we might be tempted to focus on these differences. But we forget that we have that one bond that unites all of us. 
what do we choose to focus on? Now, Paul reminds us that we are caught into this unity, not in some you know, virtual reality, but it is here, living in this church, and I don't mean building, but really in this church, this community of believers. So when we are together, when we break bread, when we fellowship, when we pray, when we um, serve together, when we evangelize together, these are the times that we are most often we may actually get frustrated with each other because we're spending so much time. The personality differences can come about. The way that we do things are different. And working with these people may require every ounce of humility, every ounce of gentleness, of patience, of forbearance that we have. And even more, we are coming to our breaking point. Now, when we are in such a situation, we are often faced with two choices. Right? Either we process it internally, right? or we have to confront the situation. Now, sometimes, and sometimes we have to process it internally and confront the situation. Right? So actually, it's three choices. Now, dealing with the conflict internally often means that we choose to work it, out, work it out ourselves without confrontation. Sometimes we are able to do it, and there are times that we find ourselves short of a certain virtue to deal with the situation. Right? And we really feel like we are at our ends and we're going to explode. Now, the good news, the good news is that we have the Holy Spirit who lives within us. And He's able and He will empower us and He will strengthen us. He will give us humility. He will give us humility, patience, uh, uh, forbearance, right? To work out that situation. And so, this good gift that we ask for, I'm certain the Father will not deny. Now, when we have to confront, and I... I know that this is not easy. Again, as, as Asians, we have uh, an aversion to confrontation. And especially in the church, we think that confrontation is not helpful. But actually, confrontation in love helps us to grow. This is a script that I've learned uh, about two years ago, and it sounds super cheesy. Okay, I admit, it sounds super cheesy. But if we can grasp what it's really trying to say, and if we are able to communicate it, whether verbatim or something similar, I believe that many conflicts can be resolved peacefully in love and unity can be maintained. And so the script goes something like this. This conflict will not undo us. The bonds that connect us in Christ are stronger than whatever divides us. This issue is important and we will deal with it without sweeping it under the carpet. But this conflict will not undo us. And you notice as in this short script, it's so packed with so much profound truths and everything that we've been talking about today. Conflict is important. It's important and it helps us to grow when we deal with it in love and holding on to the unity that bonds us. I know some of you are taking pictures, so I'll just leave it there for a while. Now, when we conduct ourselves with humility, with gentleness, with patience and forbearance, our behaviour matches up to the calling to which God has called us. And not only does our behaviour display this supernatural unity that allows the world to see the love and character of Christ, it will also lay the foundation for a deeper work of, a deeper work of unity of faith, something that we'll touch on more next week. And so now we'll come to the final question. If it's, is it a problem with our behaviour? And the next problem that we're dealing with, is it a problem with our beliefs? Now, as we read through these uh, final few verses, we are tempted to think that our calling is all about our behaviour. But, and certainly, behaviour is important, as I mentioned. But if we focus on only behaviour, we may end up doing it out of obligation. Or we may even end up being very disillusioned. Right? Because, uh, or, or we may not even be able to live it out because we are so frustrated. We, we don't even believe that we are one body of Christ. And so, for some of us, it is not a problem of behaviour per se, but it is a problem with our belief. And I propose that we have either a mistaken belief or an intellectual-only belief. I'm go, I'll go on to explain a bit more. Now, this mistaken belief uh, is, uh, can impact the unity of the body. Right? And one common uh, mistaken belief that we have is that we can live independent lives apart from each other. And we only come together for Sunday corporate worship service. While passages like Acts chapter 2, you know, 42 to 47, uh, may seem very intense for many of us here living in Singapore, living in this time and age, right, where we 
We see the early church meeting every day, sharing everything that they have. Uh, but the truth is, we have actually swung to the other side of this spectrum, where we only limit our church to this two-hour window. And everything else is for my family, my personal time, etc. And we don't give any time to the body of Christ. I would say that this is a mistaken belief. Our faith is not meant to be lived out alone. It is not an island. It is meant to be lived out in a community of faith. God showed relationship, both vertical, us and men, right? uh, God and men, and vertical, uh, and, sorry, horizontal, right? men and men, through the Trinity. Right? And so, as we think about this mistaken belief, we need to think about how we can change it. Right? And if we don't confront it, we will keep behaving in the wrong way. And so, either we are not true... I, okay, so either we have mistaken belief or we only hold it at an intellectual level. And so, an example of this intellectual belief can be when someone says, I believe that honesty is the best policy. Right? And many of us have heard that and some of us do believe that. But in practice, we may find ourselves um, telling a white lie from time to time. We find ourselves um, even outright lying in certain circumstances because there might be certain self-interest or there might be fear of the consequences that follow. And in this case, this is where we should call it out because this, this belief in honesty is not fully realised. It is purely an intellectual belief. And so the question here that we need to confront ourselves uh, in context to this passage is, do we truly believe that the gospel message that Paul has laid out in the first three chapters of Ephesians. Do we believe that we have been chosen, adopted and redeemed by God's grace through faith in Jesus Christ? Do we believe that we are now part of the body of Christ and that we have been given spiritual gifts to use for the building up of the church? If we truly believe these things, then our behaviour will naturally flow out from our beliefs. It will not be stuck just at the intellectual area when we have some discrepancies, we have our brothers and sisters of Christ who can confront us in love and in truth. And so, we will walk in a manner that is worthy of our calling. We will put off our old self of life and put on this new self that is in Christ Jesus. And we will do all this not because we are trying to earn our salvation, but because we are responding to the amazing grace that God has shown us in Christ Jesus. And so, if we want to truly believe in something, we need to take time to have a deeper level of introspection. We need to have friends who can call us out when they see that we are doing something uh, wrong. We need to reflect. We need to have this self-awareness. And I pray that as we go through the rest of the verses, we will be convicted of the truths and allow our behaviour to flow out from right beliefs. Now, what is this right belief that Paul wants us to have? Uh, and he Again, I've always told my children that Paul is very lost or he's very long-winded, right? He spent three chapters to talk about this, but now he summarizes everything in these few verses, right? He lists these seven uniting ones, right? And these seven ones, I'll just call it the seven unifiers because it can be very complicating when I say seven ones, the first one, second one, third one, okay? So I'll just call it unifiers. Okay, there are seven unifiers. The first unifier is the concept of one body, which emphasizes that all believers in Christ Jesus are part of a single family, and we are unified for a purpose. It means that you are a part of God's people, united with every other believer in Christ Jesus, whether in Yujigang Chapel, in Yujigang Gospel Hall, in Chua Chukang or Malaysia, UK, so and so forth. We are a family of Christ. It does not mean that we need to attend the same church or, at, or worship in the same way, but it means that we are part of the same spiritual family and should work together not, a, not, not against each other, but work together to further God's kingdom on earth. The second unifier is the one spirit. And so regardless of how we come to faith, whether it's as a child or at a workplace or in Sunday school, we all receive the same spirit when we accepted Jesus as our Lord and Saviour. This connects us with each other as the same Holy Spirit dwells in each of us. The same spirit dwells in me, in Daniel, in my wife, in Uncle Andrew, and so on and so forth. The same Spirit is the one connecting all of us. And so it is through the Holy Spirit that we are able to live out our faith and follow God's will. The third unifier is one hope. 
This is uh, something that all believers have in common regarding their future with God, a confidence that be- began from the time that they were called. As believers, we have this shared hope in Christ's return and the promise of eternal life. We look forward to the day where we can be united with Christ and with each other forever. Just before this uh, 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 worship, I was praying with another brother about his health and we, I was feeling really sad to hear about his health condition. But there was a hope that we had, a hope that when Christ brings us back, you know, we will have a restored body. And it's that same hope that unites him, that unites me, knowing that one day I too will have my broken body. I mean, it's already broken up, but it will be broken more, right? The, the next unifier is uh, one Lord. And this one Lord here refers um, to Jesus Christ because earlier he has referred to one spirit and later on he will refer to the Father. And so this one Lord here refers to Jesus Christ. He is the one who has provided redemption and hope and his hate over the church. So when we pursue Christ and we submit to his Lordship, we have one leadership. We are drawn naturally closer to one another. Our shared focus on Christ and his teachings bring us into harmony with one another and unites us in our faith. The fifth unifier is one faith. This faith refers, uh, most probably refers to the gospel message of salvation through Jesus Christ. Now as believers, we trust in Jesus' sacrifice for our salvation. We have faith that God has sent his son, Jesus, to become a man, to die on the cross for our salvation. It is by grace and through faith, not by anything we have done or could do, that we are saved. And this is the one faith that we have. The next is one baptism. Now, I know that when we hear one baptism, many of us start to like, is Sam going to open a can of worms? No, no. This baptism here doesn't mean the way that we conduct our baptism or even the theology behind it. But I, this baptism is something that we are all identified with Christ through our baptism. Now, every believer shares this same entry point into the walk with Christ. It is when they have been baptised into Jesus. Now, in modern context, we have uh, separated, right? The, repent, the repentance and baptism comes at uh, a time difference. But in the time of the New Testament, it was one and the same. You know, the, the, the eunuch uh, was, uh, when he was uh, being ministered by Philip, he repented and he looked at the, waters, the body of water and said, what's stopping me from being baptised? So many a times, repentance and baptism comes hand in hand. So now, while many different denominations may practice baptism differently, the fundamental importance of baptism is recognising our shared identity uh, and our entry point as followers of Christ. And now, that brings us to our last unifier, which is not, certainly not the least. Paul says that the source of all this, all that we have in common, is our God and our Father. God the Father is the one from whom all of this flows. So, if I can just put it together, um, okay, not me, but it is a theologian who put it together, that these seven unifiers can make up one sentence and explains to us what it means that the one body of believers is vitalized by the one spirit so that all believers have hope. That body is united to its one Lord, which is Christ Jesus, by each member's one act of faith and identification with him in one baptism. One God, one Father is supreme over all resides in all and is operative in all. Now, as a closing, I thought it is fitting that we will declare an old hymn together, the Church's One Foundation. Now, as the musician make their way up, um, I just want to give us some time to just um, reflect and to respond individually. I've put up the reflection questions. And so we are left with this challenge today, right? Are we walking worthy of our calling? Are we allowing the Holy Spirit to renew our mind, to change our behaviours, so that we are walking worthy of the calling that which God has called us? Are we responding to the amazing grace that God has shown us in Jesus Christ? I pray that as we walk from uh, walk out of the sanctuary and start our daily grind, our weekly grind, we will always be reminded of this incredible calling that we have received. And I pray that at the end of our life's journey, each of us can stand before God and say, yes, Lord, 
I have done my best to walk worthy of this calling. We'll just be um, three verses. Yes. this before you and before each other. Help us to repent so that we can bring glory to your name. I just want to give the benediction from Romans chapter 15 verse 5 to 6. May God who gives this patience and encouragement help you to live in complete harmony with each other as is fitting for followers of Christ Jesus. Then all of you can join together with one voice giving praise and glory to God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.